Hi, my name is Toby. I'm a second year law student here at the LSC, but don't worry, today I'm not here to give you some boring lecture on something like the Magna Carta. Today I'll be talking to you about the normalization of sexual harassment of women. But before we begin, I have a very important question to ask you. So let me set the scene for you guys. It's a Friday night, exams are done, and I'm going out with my friends to celebrate. And this is outfit option number one. And if you just give me a brief second, I'm going to do an outfit change here on stage, and I'm going to show you guys outfit option number two. So just bear with me one second. Okay, so this is option number two. Now I'm going to give you guys a bit more context. Later that night, after I'm out with my friends, I experienced sexual harassment. Now I'm going to ask you guys the important question, and I want you to be very honest in your answers, and I promise I will not be offended by them. In which outfit do you think I could have experienced sexual harassment in? Was it outfit option one I was wearing just a second ago, or is it the outfit I'm wearing right now? Show of hands for option one. And show of hands for option number two. Okay. I hate to break it to you guys, but your answers are pretty much irrelevant. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I asked you guys somewhat of a trick question. The reality is, sexual harassment has no dress code. I could have been sexually harassed while wearing outfit number one, but equally I could be sexually harassed when I'm wearing the outfit I'm wearing right now. Before we begin, I think it's best that we're all on the same basis as to what sexual harassment actually is, because often when people hear the word sexual harassment, they often think of sexual assault, when really the two aren't the same. In fact, you can experience sexual harassment without any physical touching at all. I'm sure we've all heard of catcalling or wolf whistling. Well, these are forms of sexual harassment. I know I said just a moment ago I wasn't here to talk to you about the law, but sadly, like all lawyers, I lied. <laughs> Sorry. In England and Wales, sexual harassment is defined as when someone carries out unwanted sexual behaviour towards another person. So what does this mean? Well, examples include, as I've just mentioned a moment ago, catcalling, wolf whistling, but it also includes things like unwanted sexual advancements, indecent exposure and unwanted sexting, just to name a few. Now I'm going to ask you guys another question, and again, please be honest. Could you please raise your hand if you've ever experienced sexual harassment? Thank you guys, you can put your hands down now. I know I asked you guys to be a bit vulnerable there, but you'll be glad to know that you've just answered one of the first questions I asked students here at the LSE. I interviewed 16 students, eight men, eight women, here in the LSE Law Common Room, and I asked them a series of questions about sexual harassment. Why did I do this? Well, I did this because after reading many articles and watching many documentaries about sexual harassment, I wanted to hear directly from people. I wanted to hear about their own personal experience with sexual harassment. I wanted to hear their take on the topic. And I guess most importantly, I wanted to figure out whether sexual harassment was as universal as I initially suspected. But I didn't just ask them the one question I asked you guys here today. I asked them a series of 18 questions, which revealed a lot. So I'm going to take you through some of my findings. Every single woman I interviewed had experienced sexual harassment. And many said it happened regardless of the way they were dressed. When I asked the women how many times they had experienced sexual harassment, six out of eight reported too many times to count. Every single woman I interviewed had experienced sexual harassment by the age of 16 some stating it happened as early as the age of 12. 
every single woman I interviewed said that when they had been sexually harassed, no one had ever stepped in to intervene. All 16 students categorically said that they thought it was not safe for women to go home alone at night. But when I was interviewing the men and I asked them how willing they would be to call out the misogynistic behaviour of their peers, only half of them answered with an affirmative yes. And when I asked the men how willing they would be to call out sexual harassment if they saw it taking place, again, only half of them answered with an affirmative yes. But when I asked them if they agreed with the Andrew Tate movement, all of them disagreed. So what do these results tell us? Well, number one, it tells us that sexual harassment amongst women is pervasive, and frankly, it's something that's tolerated by society. Number two, it tells us that there's a lack of intervention when people see sexual harassment taking place. And finally, it tells us that the majority of men are not willing to call out the misogynistic behaviour of their peers. So why should we be concerned? Why should anyone be concerned, frankly? Well, assuming that the answer that sexual harassment is a wrong in and of itself, or that no one should ever have to experience sexual harassment are not enough for you, not to worry because there's a bigger picture at play here. But before I reveal to you what this bigger picture is, I thought it's best that I share with you my own personal experience of sexual harassment, just to show you how normalised and pervasive sexual harassment is. After all, after asking you guys just a moment ago to be vulnerable, I guess it's only fair that I too am vulnerable. I first experienced sexual harassment when I was in primary school, so I must have been around the age of 12. I remember it was our primary school leavers dance and we were celebrating the transition from primary school to secondary school, so a big day for anyone my age back then. And I remember being so excited because our school had kindly rented out limos to take us around the streets of Edinburgh after our dance. And when we got in, we would each take turns shoving our head out the window to wave with people on the street. And I remember it was my turn and I was waving to people and we were driving past a group of men and I cannot for the life of me remember what they said but what I do remember is one of the men pulling down his trousers to indecently expose himself to me. That was my first experience with sexual harassment. For reference, I'm now 20 and I cannot for the life of me think how many times I've had to experience sexual harassment. Sexual harassment has no place where it calls home. It's happened to me when I'm walking down the street, when I'm at the gym, on public transport, at networking events. Sexual harassment has no dress code. It's happened to me when I'm dressed for a night out with my friends, but equally it's happened to me when I'm wearing the most baggiest of my clothing. Sexual harassment thrives on silent bystanders, and all the times I have been sexually harassed, no one has ever stepped in to intervene. I categorically do not feel safe walking home alone at night, but this is a part of life. So when I do have to, I'm always on edge, always on the phone to my friend. I make sure not to take the quiet roads home. Some may call this paranoia, but I call this taking necessary precautions. I do not offer smiles to people on public transport anymore because in all the times I have done, I've always ended up saying to myself, well, perhaps if you had not had smiled, he would not have taken it as his invite. I categorically live my life anticipating the worst, especially alone at night time. And it was only when I was preparing for this talk, when I was sharing my experiences with my friends, family, fellow classmates, that I realised how normalised this all was because no one was particularly shocked by the things I just said, rather they had similar stories to share. And at this point you might be thinking, well maybe she's just unlucky, wrong place, wrong time. But then by this very logic, all women are just unlucky. And maybe we all are, because we live in a society where these things are normalised and tolerated. The cat calling, the wolf whistling, the unwanted sexual advancements, but always having to be somewhat one step ahead when you're walking home alone at night. Now, if you remember, I promised to share with you what the bigger picture at play here was. Well, this is it. These acts of sexual harassment, contrary to common belief, they do not take place in a vacuum. Rather, they lead to a culture of misogyny and a society where women's lives are genuinely endangered. And we're starting to see this now. Does anyone know who this man is? Just shout it out if you do. Andrew. Yeah, correct. This is Andrew Tate. Um, fitting it very nicely, he is an alpha male influencer. 
Before <laughs> being um, banned on mainstream social media, he amassed millions of followers across several social media platforms, including 4.7 million followers on Instagram. He has made a number of degrading comments in the past, but just to rejog your memory on things he's previously said, he is infamously known for saying that women are the property of men. When being asked how he would react if a woman accused him of cheating, he said, and I quote, it's bang out the machete, boom in her face and grab her by the neck. He has previously said that rape victims bear some responsibility for being attacked. And before I forget, he himself has previously referred to himself as the king of toxic masculinity. Now you would hope that people didn't buy into this harmful and dangerous rhetoric. Sadly, people do. In fact, as of mid-August last year, NBC News reported that videos with hashtag Andrew Tate had been streamed up to 12.7 billion times on TikTok. And sadly, his harmful and dangerous rhetoric is starting to catch the attention of impressionable young boys. In fact, there's been reports from, teacher, from teachers here in the UK having to deal with male students under Tate's influence. And more recently, after his arrest in Romania after allegations of rape and trafficking, Dozens of Greek male youth stormed the capital in Athens to protest his arrest, shouting free top G. This is what a normalization of sexual harassment can lead to. We have young men today who genuinely believe that women are the property of men, are subservient to them, and as such should be treated accordingly. And I would like to say that this is where the story ends, but sadly it doesn't. Does anyone know who this man is? Yeah, correct. This is Wayne Cousins. For those who don't know him, he is the, he's the former Metropolitan Police officer that was guilty of the kidnapping, rape and murder of Sarah Everard. But what's probably not shared often enough is that before his attack, he was a serial sexual harassment offender. In fact, in 2015, whilst working for the Kent Police Force, he faced allegations of indecent exposure. And just weeks before his attack on Sarah Everard, he faced two further allegations of indecent exposure, which are currently being investigated. He was known to some of his colleagues as the rapist and was part of a three-way WhatsApp group chat with other police officers where they exchanged a number of racist and misogynistic messages, some of which included messages about raping a fellow female colleague. This is what a normalization of sexual harassment can lead to. So what can we do? What should we do? Because if we do nothing, these are the horrific headlines that wait for us. Well, you'll be glad to know that as of December last year, the government announced support for a new private member's bill that makes public sexual harassment an offence and leads to harsher sentencing for its perpetrators. And more recently, Transport for London announced a new public campaign calling customers to call out sexual harassment when they see it taking place and to support others. If you've been on the tube recently, you might have seen something like this in one of the ad spaces. These are great, these are a start, but without a conceptual shift in the way we as a society regard women and the way we regard sexual harassment, these legislation changes and these public campaigns are just wishful thinking. Because real change comes from having the tough conversations like the one we're having today. Real change comes from men being allies and having the courage to call out the misogynistic behaviour of their peers. Real change comes from people having the decency to call out sexual harassment when they see it taking place, rather than just looking the other way. In fact, real change comes a day when we're able to stop telling our daughters how to stay safe and start teaching our sons how not to inflict pain. Because when we do, we could live in a society where women genuinely felt safe walking home alone at night, where we didn't have to pre-plan our routes home. We could live in a world where dressed the way I am right now, I would not have to experience sexual harassment, but as I hope you've learned from today, sexual harassment doesn't have a dress code. So it means that dressed the way I was at the beginning of this talk, I would not have to experience sexual harassment. The reality of today is that sexual harassment of women is normalised, and I think it's high time that this reality was checked. And I hope after today, you do too. Thank you.